Hello, everyone. Bob Oxley here, and it's time for tips, topics, issues, and positions. Uh, again, uh, it's going to be a very interesting show because I want to introduce you to Dr. Jeremy Young, uh, who is a history professor at Dixie State University. And so welcome, Jeremy. Thanks. Welcome Thanks for having tips. me on. All right. And I'll tell you the reason we want you on, because uh, you've written a book. I and have. it's been published by Cambridge University Press. And uh, the topic for today is going to be charisma. And the issue is how effective is charisma Charisma, and how influential is it? Uh, the name of your book is The Age of Charisma, Leaders, Followers, and Emotions in American Society, 1870 to 1940. Wow. Uh, I've been really impressed. Uh, when I was made aware of this, I was all excited. I pleaded my case and you agreed to be on the air with us. And uh, I know our listeners will appreciate this. And uh, like we always do, we always start off with the basics. So can you just give us kind of a, an overview of um, what your book's all about? Because that uh, the, the phrase is in there, the age of charisma. So there we go. Sure. So the book is basically arguing that the modern relationship, the modern emotional connection between leaders and followers in America, political leaders, even religious leaders, social movement leaders, grew out of a series of uh, charismatic social and political movements in the late uh, 19th and early 20th centuries. And so I talk about uh, the history of these, uh, basically a particular, a unique type of public speaking that arose during that time period and the impact that it had on ordinary listeners. And I describe how those ordinary listeners really helped to shape and structure social movements at the time by basically choosing who to respond to, choosing uh, how they were going to react to these charismatic figures. And ultimately, I argue that uh, what they did was they changed the culture of leadership in America from a uh, an ideal of a very remote and distant type of leader uh, who was, uh, back before the 1870s, presidential candidates weren't even supposed to campaign directly uh, with, with, with voters because it was, they were, it was viewed as they, they were being demagogues, uh, to this new ideal where if a presidential candidate or a minister or a social movement leader doesn't shake hands and kiss babies and meet voters and give speeches, they're viewed as out of touch. They're viewed as undemocratic. And so it's a democratic element of our society that we take for granted, and it grew out of this unique time period in American history, the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Wow. Uh, could you give some examples of the public speakers that, that you discuss in your book? Uh, you've mentioned uh, an overview, and now we're going to get into specifics. Can I'm sure you've identified some speakers that... <laughs> Uh, ab this absolutely. So uh, one of the people that I talk about, one of the most charismatic speakers of this time period uh, was a guy named William Jennings Bryan. Uh, and Bryan uh, was a three-time presidential candidate for the Democrats. He was a, uh, he was a, uh, a congressman from Nebraska who uh, adopted this unique form of public speaking, which uh, kind of unbeknownst to him, he learned uh, in, in, uh, in college taking these elocution classes, uh, the old public speaking training people did in the mid-1800s, and he just had this, this remarkable ability to connect with people. In 1896, he goes to the Democratic National Convention as a relatively unknown figure, and he gives uh, a speech called the Cross of Gold speech, uh, in which he, he so transfixes the audience and so thrills them that they basically nominate him for president even though they've never heard of him before. Uh, and he's not the only person doing this. He's also traveling across the country, speaking to audiences all over the country at a time, again, when presidential candidates weren't supposed to do this. Um, another uh, very charismatic figure of the time uh, was Billy Sunday, who was the sort of precursor to Billy Graham as the most important revivalist minister in the country. Billy Sunday also had the same training. He, they, he and uh, William Jennings Bryan studied out of the same textbook, uh, <laughs> actually, as did uh, Wendell Phillips, the abolitionist orator, uh, and a bunch of other people. Um, and uh, again, uh, Billy Sunday was able to, to probably got a, a million people to convert or reconvert uh, to Christianity. Um, 
and uh, there's a whole bunch of others. One of the, a couple of people we talk about uh, are people who tried but failed to use this charismatic speaking style. One example would be Theodore Roosevelt, of all people. Mm. Roosevelt didn't have any training in college in this unique speaking style. Uh, and while he was a very charismatic speaker in a sort of general sense, uh, he often didn't understand why. Uh, he didn't under- understand why it was that he was having the kind of impact that he did. So sometimes uh, he wouldn't give enough speeches. He wouldn't talk to enough audiences. Uh, and then wouldn't understand why he wasn't getting the votes. I understand. That William Jennings Bryant, uh, seems to me there's a play called Inherit the Wind. Yes. And uh, the the Scopes uh, Monkey Trial in Tennessee. And he was the speaker, one of the speakers. I remember that. Uh, they made a movie. So. Oh, yeah. And the Scopes Monkey Trial is a, is a great example of, uh, of sort of two different methods of public speaking. Both he and Clarence Darrow, the defense attorney that he's arguing against, are different kinds of effective speakers. And Brian thinks that his kind of bombastic oratory that works so well on the campaign trail is going to work for him in that situation. And really, it's Darrow's ability to, to, to sort of closely argue the merits of the case in front of the audience, in front of the, the jury, the, the, the just 12 people that is much more effective in the court of law that's interesting um gender you know we are i'm you know sociologists so i've got to ask this question do you see a, a, an effective and influence uh, charisma uh, between male and female so charisma turns out to be a lot harder for women to use the speaking style, hmm. to use charisma in general. And it's not because women are less charismatic. It's because social biases are much stronger against charismatic women. The idea that Americans have that women should be uh, should be humble, quiet, uh, <laughs> not, not sort of take out a big, broad position on something uh, really works uh, against charisma. And so there's all sorts of examples in this time period of charismatic women who are uh, discriminated against, opposed. Uh, one uh, charismatic suffrage orator, Anna Howard Shaw, uh, some of the suffrage, uh, some of the anti-suffrage activists in the 1900s once set fire to a lecture hall where she was wow. lecturing full of people. She had to figure out how to get everybody out of the hall so they wouldn't burn to death. Um, there's a there's a, a charismatic uh, Pentecostal minister named Mariah Woodworth Eder uh, who gets arrested for uh, for mental insanity because these two doctors in St. Louis just can't believe. Uh, that that a woman could be that charismatic, uh, and they actually the, the journalists interview them and say, uh, "Is this is this possible? Uh, is she just charismatic?" And they say, "No, I don't think she has any charisma," uh, because I get, apparently they're experts in that or something, being medical wow. doctors. Uh, <laughs> and and that's it's it, nevertheless there are a lot of women who figure out ways to work around this, ways to use charisma effectively, uh, and sort of sort of push back against these biases. But it's very hard for them. Got it. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, let me ask you another question. Uh, your book covers 1870 to up to 1940. African Americans at that time, uh, as far as having charisma, I know that with the slaves and uh, we're talking post the Civil War. Right? Did were they respected? Did they have charisma? Could they get groups to uh, stand up for their rights uh, to go against discriminatory policies? So there's definitely a lot of charisma among African-American speakers during this time period, in particular the way that African-American ministers in this period are uh, learning to speak in their churches is drawn from a sort of relevant uh, uh, variant of this charismatic speaking style. And the issue is uh, not whether they're they're charismatic. Many of them are. Uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois speaks in a charismatic way. Booker T. Washington, uh, Marcus Garvey, um, and people who a lot of people haven't heard of. Reverdy Ransom, uh, various bishops of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. The, the difficulty is getting white audiences to listen to them. Um, so uh, Booker T. Washington is very effective at this, of course, uh, but he's effective not because just because he's charismatic, but because he is uh, basically offering to give up African American political and social equality. <laughs> so the audiences, the white audiences who are opposed to that, are are comfortable with him because he's not really convincing them of anything. Whereas someone like Marcus Garvey, uh, who is making a, a, a more radical statement uh, for, in favor of uh, some kind of equality or power for African Americans uh, is just just faces the same kind of unrelenting uh, opposition that many women speakers did. That's interesting. Um, charisma. 
why is it some people can walk into a room and start talking and everybody gets attracted to them and listens to them? Like you think to yourself, if you don't have charisma, like how, how did they get that? And how influential and how effective, how does, why do people follow this? I mean, we, we find ourselves attracted to certain people and we try to emulate them, but we're not as effective, obviously. Um, have you given any research on that? So charisma is something that uh, has a sort of uh, has a variety of meanings. Uh, so some people will say that charisma is an innate behavior that some people have and others don't. Other people will say it can be learned. Um, my argument is that it's situational more than anything else. The people in in the movements that I study had a very specific type of charisma, a very specific uh, speaking style, which fit well for their audience, but it wouldn't fit well everywhere in every time or every place. Um, the thing that makes, to me, that makes charisma uh, distinctive is that it's a unique relationship between a leader and an audience. Um, it, it, you, one of the things I did in my research is compared the letters that people wrote to William Jennings Bryan and Billy Sunday with the letters that they wrote to uh, other other leaders, people like uh, Benjamin Harrison, a, a good public speaker uh, who was president, but someone who didn't really have this charismatic training. And there were plenty of people who wrote letters to Benjamin Harrison and saying how much they liked what he said, but it just wasn't uh, the, the people people who write to, to Brian and to Sunday use almost religious language to talk about them. They call them Moses or Jesus, uh, and we're not just talking about ministers here, but a secular figure like Brian. Mm. Uh, and it's it's this is the sort of unique. Uh, relationship. Charisma leads people to commit in a very dedicated way to follow someone and their movement. It's not just a momentary feeling. It's something that lasts for a long time, years, decades. Um, and it really is very effective at building powerful social, political, and religious movements uh, in a way that that uh, just a normal uh, speaker is not. And there, there are people uh, people who have that quality are it, it's not a you know it's not a quality again that would work everywhere but it works for their particular audience in the particular moment where they are wow um then going along with what you just said uh is charisma universal or is it situational in other words they're effective the charismatic uh influence is a, is more effective in groups that they that um, agree with what they're speaking about, or is it really so, this person could be transposed into some other environment and be just as charismatic as they are with the ones that they're successful with? Uh, so this is a, a question that's really debated a lot in the sort of growing field of charisma studies. Is is charisma uh, something that you know a, a charismatic person is charismatic everywhere? Um, I tend to think no, but there are some studies that have shown some similarities across cultures and across times. One of the most common similarities that I've, that I've seen is that um, people who are charismatic speak with an expanded pitch range. So their highs are very high and their lows are very low. Uh, and you can even hear William Jennings Bryan doing this uh, in a recording of him giving that cross of gold speech. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. And that seems, I mean, I'm not, I'm not doing it in a very charismatic way, but that seems to be a, 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 a somewhat of a universal, even across cultures. Uh, other things, other particular particularities of how charismatic people present themselves, uh, not universal. And in fact, sometimes you'll see someone who I think is distinctly uncharismatic and they're, people view them in a charismatic way simply because of the role that they're playing because they're a, they're a leader of a movement that means a lot to people or they represent some some idea that has changed someone's life got it wow um i have a question i'm going to update you okay i know your book covers 1870 to 1940 but i know the amount of research that you've been put into this and to uh, be successful and uh have a, a publication now a book by cambridge university press so I got you here, so I'm going to ask, why do people today, and maybe it's just me, uh, not, uh, they don't seem to be as charismatic as they were in the past. If you look at the old films and the people plotting and cheering and following, and uh, is it because people aren't as articulate today, or is it because a segment of society is not as um, familiar with a given vocabulary? Is it, can you give me any insight on that? That's a great question. I think that 
um, actually the, the major cause of that shift had to do with the, be- the beginning of electronic media more than anything else. Charisma is the most effective when it's in front of a live audience, when, when the person is speaking to people who are right in front of them. Uh, one key component of, of a charismatic uh, encounter is somebody gets to shake the hand of the charismatic figure. They talk about this in their letters, how powerful that is. Well, if you're listening to people on the radio, uh, if, you're, if you're looking at people on, on television, uh, they have more of a reach, a broader reach, than they'd ever have in person. But the, their, their uh, effect on people is a lot more diffuse. They aren't able to inspire quite the same kind of uh, emotional response. And, and, they, and also, the same techniques don't work. Uh, so charismatic speakers who tried to adapt to the radio... Uh, had a lot of trouble because they would uh, walk back and forth on the stage. And if you walk back and forth uh, on the radio, if I were to walk back and forth right now, you couldn't hear me because the <laughs> microphone right. wouldn't wouldn't travel with me. Uh, and uh, another thing is that, that all that high highs and low lows. I mean, you saw heard how silly that sounds on the radio. It sounds silly on the radio. It sounds silly on television. Um, people in the 1920s embraced a more conversational style of public speaking. One of the advocates of that actually was Dale Carnegie, the guy who wrote uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People, uh, he started his career as a public speaking teacher, and he advocated for this this more speak to people uh, through the media and as you would speak to a friend in a conversation. Wow. And that's what people begin to do. Now, uh, when Franklin Roosevelt does the fireside chats, he's getting a lot of very charismatic responses from people. People are really moved by the fireside chats. They send him letters, they, they, they're full of all this same religious language, but he's not using the same style that people were using earlier. People say that they, they one person says that they leave an, an easy chair in their house uh, when they listen to him on the radio because they, they imagine him sitting right there talking to them. And another person writes uh, to him that uh, before she heard him on the radio, she thought of the President of the United States as just an item in the newspaper or a picture to look at, but he was real. Wow. And so it's very powerful, but it's not the same thing. It's not the same kind of charisma. The, the, the emotional connection is there. The relationship is there. But the speaking style and the, the individual power of the speaker is gone. You just, uh, <clears throat> my thinking cap just came alive here. You know what I'm thinking about? Like the, if you wanted to devoid from this question, you can. But I've got to ask this question. Um, is... The current president of the United States, President Donald Trump, is he considered a charismatic speaker based on your research and and bringing it right up to date? Is he charismatic? Well, he's certainly a charismatic figure. Um, I wouldn't say he uses the same speaking style that I studied. His speaking style is based on uh, the sort of reality TV ethos that he uh, learned to speak to the public through. But certainly the relationship between him and his followers is the same. If you go to a Trump rally, watch video of a Trump rally, you will see people responding to Trump in the way that they responded to William Jennings Bryan or Billy Sunday in this very emotional, almost quasi-religious fashion. Um, and so certainly as a, as a charismatic relationship, uh, he is very much like what I've studied. Wow, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Uh, to go along with that, um, do you see any speakers uh, as far as being uh, potential candidates uh, for the upcoming presidential election in 2020 that maybe that you've identified or you've listened to them talk or you've had an opportunity to attend an event where they spoke that have this charismatic um, expertise? I definitely think this is going to be an interesting election cycle when it comes to charisma. The The previous election, um, Hillary Clinton actually made, made some interesting statements about how difficult charisma was for her as a woman because when she appeared uh, in charismatic ways, uh, she would she would get criticized and accused of being hysterical and all these words that are often used to criticize charismatic women. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential candidates uh, who we're talking about for 2020 who have a lot of charisma in their speaking style. I think Elizabeth Warren actually is a very charismatic speaker. Um, I think she uses in interesting ways a lot of the techniques that, that, I've, that I've, I've studied. 
Um, I would also say uh, someone like Beto O'Rourke, who is uh, running a competitive Senate race on the Democratic side in Texas. Uh, if he were to win that race and were to run for president, he's certainly a very charismatic speaker. Uh, Cory Booker is a pretty charismatic speaker. And of course, uh, don't forget Oprah Winfrey, uh, yeah. who I don't think is going to run, but who has more charisma in her little finger than all the other politicians in the country have in their whole bodies. That's yeah, Everybody's on the Oprah bandwagon. I remember when that show first started, I said, I don't think this is going to last long. Boy, little did I know. She has just an unbelievable ability to connect with with an audience. I mean, all she has to do is mention a book's title, and it sells millions. She's, she's one of the most talented speakers. She's probably the most talented living public speaker in the United States today. Okay, can I test you one more time? Sure. <clears throat> the current president of the United States, and you indicated that he has a little bit of his charismatic yeah. uh, expertise. Um you think that might be dangerous in his case? People want to uh, people want to talk about that, and I think that's a good thing to talk about. Whether charisma is dangerous, uh, or whether it's part, because I, of course, have been arguing in this book that charisma is an essential part of democracy. That it connects uh, voters with leaders in a way that uh, transcends how big the country is, how how distant we sometimes feel from our leaders. And yet, there is a lot of concern about Trump and the way that he uses charisma, the way that he uses it to attack the media, for instance, or or to to uh, make people angry. Um, my take on this is that charisma is a tool. It is neither good nor bad. Um, it can be used for good. It can be used for bad. And we shouldn't, if we have a charismatic politician that we like, we shouldn't decide that that means charisma is always good. And if we have a charismatic politician that we're uncomfortable with, that doesn't mean we should decide charisma is always bad. I would also say that sometimes uh, the best way, if someone wants to run against uh, Donald Trump, sometimes the best way to beat a charismatic leader is with another charismatic leader. Sometimes uh, there are people who are voting for someone someone uh, because of their charisma and would vote for someone else who also had charisma whose ideas agreed more with them. So I think it's a tool. I don't think it's good or bad. I think I think we want to ascribe value to it uh, when it's it's just the politicians we're looking at that, that are endowing it with value. Okay. When he does go to these rallies, I'm talking President Trump, when he goes to the rallies, uh, the people there are just... Uh uh, they're they're prepared before he even gets on the stage. Uh, they can't wait for to hear him say things. And one thing that I've noticed, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, he uses vocabulary that makes sense to the people, the audience that he's giving his speech to, uh, which other peoples that may be more intellectual may say that he's using the 25 cent word instead of the 50 dollar word and uh, laugh at him or say that uh, ridicule him. But like we've just discussed, he does have that charismatic uh, expertise. And it, by being uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, elements for charismatic is being able to read your audience and use the necessary vocabulary the, because you're trying to get them to understand what you're talking about. Is that really a, a key factor to being charismatic? Even though you might have this natural ability uh, that's been trained. Uh, just what's your feeling on that? Well, I like I like to focus in my research on the uh, on the sort of uh, non uh, the the sort of emotional qualities of the spe of the speaking style rather than of the rhetoric, the words that are being used. Okay. But I definitely think that uh, using words that people can connect to is is very important. And Trump isn't the only president to do that. Uh, Ronald Reagan was famous for using small words and using them very effectively. Um, are you better off now than you were four years ago remains the most effective uh, possible, pro probably the most po effective possible uh, campaign slogan ag against an incumbent president. Um, but actually, one, one of the interesting things I found in my research is so there were a couple of union organizers uh, in the industrial workers of the world in this earlier time period who were trying to organize um, uh, basically uh, people who didn't speak English and the speakers didn't speak the languages of the people they were trying to organize. Uh, and the way that they did this, uh, and I think only the camera can see this if you're watching this on YouTube, but on the radio you won't you won't see what I'm doing. Um, they would this this guy taught uh, a guy named uh, Big Bill Haywood taught uh, speakers how to do how to how to organize people when they couldn't speak the same language. And what he did was, he said uh, he took his hand and he uh, spread his fingers really wide, uh, and he he'd, he'd point to each of the fingers, and then he'd point to the workers, and then he would push his fingers together 
and he would and he would make a fist and he would say one big union. Wow. <laughs> and they got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you uh, that's exactly I mean that's a symbol and that's an image and people will never forget that image. Absolutely. Ben, that's that's fantastic. Um let me ask you a question now. I'm taking I'm going around. Okay. What incented you to write about charisma? How did this happen? It's very interesting. I um I've always been someone who responded to uh, charismatic speakers, um, even from when I was a kid. I was interested in politics largely because I found certain politicians inspiring. I can't even remember now who they were. Um, and as in history as well, I was inspired by a lot of the people in the time period that I studied. Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, just reading their speeches just, just inspired me a lot. And I wanted to know why. I wanted to understand why it was that uh, people, and not just me, but other people, were so inspired uh, by this. Uh, and uh, so when I started looking into it, I, I, my, my original thought was it was something that they were saying. It was the kind of leaders that they were. And then I started looking into it and I discovered, uh, no, they all read the same textbook. They all spoke in the same way. And interestingly, I discovered that some of the people I thought had been the most charismatic, Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, uh, were more charismatic in on paper than they were when you actually listened to them speak. And, and so there was a lot of charisma going on in this period, but it wasn't all the people I thought it was. Well, Dr. Young, I hate to tell you this, but we've just got the high sign. We're going to have to wrap this one up. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this has uh, been Dr. Jeremy Young, and uh, he's been gracious enough to come on our show today and talk about his book, uh, The Age of Charisma, Leaders, Followers, and Emotions in American Society, 1870-1940 published by the Cambridge, Cambridge University Press. Uh, Dr. Young, thank you so much for being here. Uh, oh, so, it's been wonderful. And I, as I told you, time does fly on this show. And oh, I, could, yeah. I could ask you 100 more questions, trust me. Yet, uh, but I really appreciated you taking the time out of your busy schedule and uh, coming and talking to our listeners and uh, other people that can watch us on Facebook and that uh, for the tip show. But thank you so much for being here. It's a real pleasure, Bob. Thanks okay. for having me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been another episode of Tips, Topics, Issues, and Positions. Uh, you can listen to us at uh, on Fridays at 3 o'clock uh, live on, uh, on the KDXI 100.3 FM, uh, as well as you can take a look at us anytime you want at your convenience at our beautiful faces on Facebook, on YouTube, on podcast, Podbean's our affiliate there, uh, as well as Twitter. So you can take a look at us and listen to the show at your convenience anytime you'd like. So until we get together next week, uh, please have a safe and enjoyable week. And this is Bob Oxley for tips saying goodbye, everybody.